If you have a Bible with you, go ahead and open up to Matthew chapter 6. As you know, we spent a couple of sermons, Sundays, going through the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Um, Jesus began back in chapter 5 with what, for some reason, is referred to the Beatitudes, but the Blesseds are, right? And those that are poor in spirit, mourning, meek, which hunger and thirst after righteousness, who are merciful, who are pure, pure in heart, peacemakers, persecuted for righteousness' sake. And my observation, and one I believe to be true, is that these are all characteristics of God's children. That only one who has been born again can hunger and thirst after righteousness. Only one who's been born again by the Holy Spirit can mourn for their sins they can be a true peacemaker, not for ulterior motives, but because that is what our Heavenly Father desires us to do. And we're seeking to please Him. Um, and they're blessed, and there's a result that for each of them, and again, the characteristics are all describing the same people, the same result is for each. They'll be with the Lord. He's prepared a kingdom for them. They'll inherit the earth, not this broken earth, but a new earth, a new heaven and a new earth. Um, they will see God. If they're hungering and thirsting after righteousness, they'll be filled with righteousness. Y'all ever... Do you, do you think about that? Have you? Do you just ever desire that you could be righteous? Not just a little bit. Or not just at times. You, sometimes you, you feel like, alright, I'm walking close to the Lord and it's great, but Five minutes go by and somebody pushes your button and you just blow off the handle. Or something doesn't go the right way or the IRS gives you a call or something, right? It's just, and suddenly that, that close walk you had, you've, just, you've chunked it out the window, right? I, I desire to be righteous and for it to be permanent. Right? There's a groaning for that eternity that we're looking forward to where it doesn't it's no longer temporary it's not just for a time you know we have peaks and valleys with our, our walk with the Lord we can get up on the clouds and you'll just have a, a wonderful time and we're so close and it seems pretty shortly thereafter we're in the valley and we're in the muck and all we can see is our sin and grossness and oh it says that those that are hungering and thirsting after righteousness they'll be filled Y'all ever gone very long without eating or drinking? Okay. Does that food or drink get more important to you as time goes on? Yeah, there's, a, there's an urgency. There's a craving. There's a desire. There's a necessity. And this is not just a merely, oh yeah, that'd be nice. Kind of like you go and get a car. Yeah, we'll throw in the floor mats. Okay. That'd be nice. Not really going to make a difference whether I want the car or not, but okay, I've got floor mats, so I don't. Right? That's the hunger. Our hunger and thirsting for righteousness should not be eh, an accessory. Right? It should be a strong, urgent desire. So we've got. He described here the characteristics. What you know, you are the salt of the earth. Right? He's describing what that salt tastes like. These characteristics of his children. You're the light of the world. He's describing to you what that light looks like. You don't get to make it up and say, well, I am Christian, therefore I can be whatever I want, and this is a reflection of God. No. It's more like you're a mirror. Does a mirror get to change what the light looks like? Now, if you're reflecting God's light, it will look like Him. Okay? And then he goes on to tell them that your righteousness needs to exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. Now, the scribe was one who would copy out the law. And they were like the, the, the scholars. They knew about the Old Testament law. They knew about the letter of the Old Testament Bible. 
And the Pharisees are ones who were known for how they applied it. And it looked, by the way, that you, if you looked at him, you would say, wow, look at that righteous person. Right? He does, he checks all the boxes. And here Jesus is saying, your righteousness has to exceed that. And he drills down into the heart issues of the areas where, yeah, they may look like they're being righteous on the outside, but from the heart out, it's just a show. Okay, and so it talked about um, the difference between murder and hating your brother. Right? Yeah, okay. You never killed somebody. Congratulations. Does that make you righteous? Well, if I'm standing here and I'm hating you, you've got something I want and I just despise you for it. One, I'm being covetous, but two, right? That's committing murder in your heart. Right? That's the unrighteousness. Okay, so there's not a facade of righteousness about us. This is a righteousness that comes from the inside out. And the only way you can have that pure heart and that pure conscience and live out the charity of God is if He has put His Holy Spirit within you. It's a miracle of grace. Right? And it goes on about um, you know, taking adultery to the next level without lusting with your eyes. Right? It takes... Um, Marriage to the next level. It's not just putting away, but it's a permanent covenant. Um, takes um, your oaths, what you say. Y'all, our society and we hold our word very cheaply. Right? You know, you're watching old movies. My word is my bond. And you just kind of have to chuckle. It's like, nobody means that. We need to have a 40 page contract so that your word will become your bond. But what comes out of our mouth, we should follow through. We should never say anything light or cheaply, right? We should. There is quite a bit of language in the Old Testament that talks about how God despises lying, right? Sixteen, six things doth the Lord hate; yea, seven are an abomination unto them. Two of those are lying. One's bearing false witness, and the other's lying lips. Okay, so it's. It's taking this superficial level of righteousness and describing what genuine righteousness is. All right? he's, he's giving God's standard. He um, goes on about not resisting the evil. The Lord says, vengeance is mine. He'll repay. It's not your job to get justice here. All right? Don't resist the, the evil. Going on, 43, you've heard to love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Is that the standard that Jesus gives us? Is it? No. It says you have to love even your enemy. Bless them that curse you. Is that your natural response if somebody's cussing you out at Walmart? Do good to those that hate you. Is that your natural response? Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. None of this is your natural response. That's the point. But this is what we're called to do. This is what we're enabled to do. This is what leaning into the, the spiritual aspect of our life, walking by the Spirit, walking in faith, putting on that new man, this is what that new man is called to do. All right. So first, uh, chapter 6. You know, I, say, I say all that because this is all one sermon, right? Jesus is teaching. This is all the same event. We can't just kind of parcel it out and forget where we've come from. And so there's this idea of walking away from the hypocritical behavior. You know what hypocrite means? It means to play the part. An actor on a stage, right? Y'all ever played the part where you're just pretending to be something because you wanted other people to think that? Right? I remember middle school and high school, depending on who was around, I could act a certain way or it could be a completely different. If you're around the jocks, you're around the nerds, you're around the theater kids or whatever, it's just my language would change. The things that I found funny, which I mean, just, I was a hypocrite. I was playing a part, okay? When it comes to our service to God, we cannot play the part, okay? So, chapter 6 says, Take heed, all right, take heed. Give caution, pay attention to this. Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your 
of your Father which is in heaven. I'm going to read the rest of this kind of block together and we'll come back. Otherwise you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound the trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have a reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and that thy Father, which seeth in secret himself, shall reward thee openly. All right, we're going to have this pattern, three different things. First with alms, then with praying, then with fasting. The same message is true for each of them, is that your motivation for doing them should not be to be seen of men. All right? Y'all, we care about other people's opinions way too much. Okay? We put too much value in what so-and-so thinks of me or how I, they think I look or how they treat me, whatever, right? Who do you stand and fall before? Not rhetorical. God, right? He's your audience. He's the one. So if you are giving alms, now an alms is just a compassion. All right? and all, you know, scripture describes the, the disciples walking into the temple and there be beggars there. Couldn't walk couldn't care for themselves, and they would be asking alms, a compassion. And so when you're giving an alms, you're showing, actively showing compassion, mercy. Right? Does this say, if you do alms? No, it says when. When you do alms. So what's implied there? You will be giving alms. Right? That's good. That's right. That's following through. Right? But again, that's just kind of the outer layer. What Christ is doing is drilling down to the inner layer of what's your motivation? Yes, it's a given that you should. Showing compassion. Is your fa Heavenly Father merciful to you? You better believe it. Are you called to show mercy to others? You better believe it. Right? As much as you've done to the least of one of these, you've done it unto me directly. You know, that's Jesus talking about all the ways that you show compassion to His little children around the world. It's as if you're ministering to Him directly. So, should you give alms? Yes. Okay, that's a given. But be careful that when you do it, you don't do it to be seen of others. Um, otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Right? If your motivation is to be seen and you are seen, guess what? You've got what you wanted. It doesn't go any farther. Is your alms giving then pleasing to God? No, you weren't seeking to please him. He wasn't really part of the equation. You were seeking to get respect or honor or some degree of, I don't know, from men, right? Man, look what a good guy he is. Okay, and so take heed, have caution. Why should you have caution about this? Because you're all tempted to do it, including myself. We can do the right thing and easily slip into the bad motivation. Right? Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogue. Okay, do you think that these guys who are walking in the synagogue with their pennies or whatever they're going to give to the poor beggar, do you think they're literally having someone walk in front of them with a trumpet? Probably not. Maybe, but probably not. But more likely, it was an overly dramatic gesture. Oh, yes, we have some poor here. Let me drip into my purse. And oh, there you go. And talking in a loud way so everyone can see what's going on. And everyone has to look and say, oh, my. What a good fellow this is. Right? What's the modern day equivalent of that? Guys, I'm here on Facebook Live. And we've got a poor person over here, and they have not eaten for three days, and I've got a hamburger. And here it is, I'm giving it to it, and look at their smiling, and oh, right. Right? They have their reward. They want to be seen of men. Okay. Very last Sandy, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. Okay. What do you think this means? Does this mean I have to operate like a Mission Impossible agent with everything with absolute security and secrecy so that no one can ever know the good things that I do? 
No, that's another ditch. All right? Because you know what that'll do? That'll be an excuse for why I don't have to. Well, I'd help that guy, but he's he's standing out in public. There's other folks around. <laughs> Sorry. The idea is if you're walking along and there's a guy here on your left who needs help and you're walking with someone on the right, you should be able to discreetly do it where the guy on the right doesn't even know about it. Right? If someone finds out about it, is that a big deal? No, but it goes to your motivation. Y'all, we have discretion. We can operate discreetly. Right? Now, parents. Does that mean my children should never see me giving alms, being compassion? No, and in fact, they should, because part of your job is to teach. The same way as me as a pastor. Part of what I have to do is teach and set the example. But that's a very different motivation than trying to look good in front of my kids or look good in front of the congregation, right? So our motivation should be, I'm doing this because it pleases my Heavenly Father. And if I'm doing it in such a way that I can please Him... I'll be trying to do it in a way where I don't tempt myself to take some vanity and pride in my conduct. right? Because the best of us, we start getting some feedback, our little head starts swelling, and suddenly what was right, we've now done with for a poor reason. Right? So what's our motivation for serving God? Is it to be seen of men? No! right? If that's why you're here, if you're here at church just to be seen of who's here, that's a sorry reason, right? We come here because we want to worship and adore the Lord our God. I want to love Him more. I want to come together with our other group of sinners who want to love Him more and encourage them and have us all be built up together and draw closer to Him. That's part of why we come together. It's not to be seen or have the role checked of, yes, I'm here. Right? So what's our motivation? The alms may be in secret, and that thy Father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. All right. So here's a fun nugget that he get if you go look at the Greek. That word openly was, I think, three different words. He'll reward thee openly in the shining. Openly. In the shining. What do you think that's talking about? When everything is revealed... When everything is made plain. Y'all know what's so great about Hebrews chapter 11? You have all these flawed individuals. Noah. He got into some issues, right? His sons found him drunk and naked in his tent. Abraham. He got into some issues, right? He took some bad advice from his wife and wound up having an illegitimate child with his handmaid, trying to fulfill God's promise. Like, you read that, and you can find almost in all of them something that the Bible says, here's why they messed up. But do you know what's not recorded in Hebrews chapter 11? Any of those things. The only things that are recorded are where they, through faith, were obedient to God. And do you know what's going to be so great about that last day for God's children? Is that He's going to acknowledge those fruits that you've borne on His account, whether it's 30-fold or 60-fold or 100-fold, your sins are not going to be brought up because they've been put away. As far as the east is from the west, Christ says, I've paid for that. You don't have to give an accounting or make that good. And if they're revealed at all, it's just going to be Christ going, I paid for that one too. It's not held against you. But your Heavenly Father knows what you've done. And if no one knows it here, He does. And it says He'll reward thee openly. Now, does that mean you're going to get a bigger piece of the heavenly pie? Not a lick. All right, there's a great parable about all these folks working for a penny. Whether you work for 12 hours in the heat of the day or just the last 30 minutes. The inheritance that's been purchased for you, you all get the same inheritance. But your Heavenly Father knows when you're seeking Him. Right? Hebrews, uh, actually, see, but Hebrews 11, about you can't go and please Him unless you go uh, going by faith. Let me. I'm just going to read it because I'm butchering it. Hebrews 11. It's impossible to please Him without faith. Hebrews 11:6. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. What does that tell me? It's possible to please Him. How? With faith. Where do you get faith from? 
He gives it to you. But without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. That's encouraging to me. Right? He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. You and I should be motivated in our Christian walk not to be seen of people to get accolades, but to be seen by our Heavenly Father, whether anybody else sees it or not, because we are pleasing Him. You want to please your Heavenly Father? Diligently seek Him. Serve Him. Do the things that we're called to do. You're created a new creature unto good works that we should live and walk in them. Why? So that people can see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Right? If you're living this out in your life, folks will notice, but that shouldn't be your motivation. They'll notice and they'll glorify God. Right? So that's with giving alms. Same pattern here when praying. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Right. Now, I haven't seen any of y'all come down here on a Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock and just start standing in the middle of the sanctuary and start praying. Yes, you could. But if there's a whole bunch of other people around, what are you doing that for? You can commune with your father at home just as easily. right? And in there, you don't have that temptation of I'm doing it just to be seen of men. Now, this is not talking about in our worship service when we're asking somebody to lead us together in prayer. This is somebody having a private prayer, but doing it out loud so people can see him and they can see, wow, what a religious person am I? All right? This is like the difference between the guy who never prays at home, but when he goes out to a restaurant with his family, he has to pray so loud that everyone in the church in the restaurant knows, oh, these people are praying. Who's he praying for? Himself, to be seen in men. Right? That's what the hypocrites do. They love. Love means fond of. Fond to pray in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets. I mean, just imagine walking downtown Tifton. There's somebody on the corner of the street and they're just praying out loud, Oh, Lord, thank you for blessing me to be so great and not being like these other jokers. He's not doing that to commune with his Heavenly Father. He's doing that to be seen to men. So the admonition for us is, But when thou prayest, enter into your closet. When you shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. In the shining, same thing. If your motivation is to please your Heavenly Father, then go and commune with Him. Commune with Him in private. Now, if you have a bedroom in your house, you don't have to physically go into the closet in that bedroom. But the idea is, go in by yourself when you're going to commune with your Father, when you're going in private prayer. Because He knows. You don't have to be seen of others. And, and taking away that temptation of you being seen can have that be a more fervent time. You should want to go and spend time with your Father in prayer. Now, this whole chapter is full of references to your Father. Your Father. Thy Father. This is not just some removed creator who set up the world like a top and had it spinning and just hands off. But the Spirit that He's put up within you when you're born again allows you to cry out to God and say, Father! My Father! Right? Hopefully there's a difference with how you talk to someone who was your father versus everyone else. Right? There's, there's a relationship there. When you go to a natural father, you expect him to, one, be happy to see you, and to want to hear from you, and will care about what you're saying, and care about what you need. Now take that to an infinitely higher degree and love and perfection and care and wisdom and knowledge, and that's who you're crying out to. My Father! Your Father. That is a special relationship. Verse 7, But when you pray, use not vain repetitions. 
uh, that use and uh, vain repetitions is actually repeated. The idea is uh, babbling to utter just over and over and over and over again. Useless talk. When you pray, use not vain repetitions, as the heathen do, for they think they should be heard for their much speaking. All right? So there was a pattern back then, and that pattern exists again today, and that folks think, well, if I want this God, whether it's an idol or the actual God, to hear me, i got to say this over and over and over and over again. Guess what? God ain't dumb. Right? Sometimes with little children, we have to say the message over and over and over and over and over again, right? God is not so. You're not heard more by God because you've said the same thing over and over again. And in fact, he's going to give a model of a very brief, brief prayer. Be, not, be ye therefore, be not, excuse me, be not ye therefore like unto them. For your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before you ask him. God is smart, right? God is the smartest. God, all knowledge, it's his. He's never learned anything. You can't come with him for new information, but the prayer, you're, you're told to come. And it's for your good, one, for your humbling and recognizing your dependence upon Him. One, it's another opportunity to worship Him and to recalibrate yourself of who am I in relation to this? This God is this big. He's huge. He's powerful. He's mighty. And He loves me. And these are the things that I stand in need of. And I'm just a poor beggar coming and asking for help. And I'm submitting myself to your will. Prayers for our benefit, for our recalibration of our relationship with God and how we're going to interact in this world. For your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before you ask Him. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. So He's going to give, you know, a model prayer that we can follow. And I want you to listen to the plurals. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. How often do our prayers get very me-focused when all of this was very we-focused, right? We're a church. We're a body. We should be praying these things for each other. The primary focus of this is actually on God, though, right? Our Father which art in heaven. We have a shared relationship with Heavenly Father. I have no greater claim to Him than you. But because we have that same claim, that makes us brothers. That makes us sisters. Why do we call each other brother and sister? As a reminder of the relationship we have because of Christ's work to our Heavenly Father. Our Father which art in heaven. He is in heaven. This is true. This is saying this is not our natural Father. This is our... Heavenly Father. Who am I addressing? My Heavenly Father. Our Heavenly Father. Hallowed be thy name. All right. When I was young, I'd be confused about this. It's like, how can, how can I make God's name holy? Right? God is holy. I can't change anything. So why do I pray that? Hallowed be thy name. Let me put it in this way. What if you thought about this as a request that we would treat and regard His name as holy? May your name be holy in my mouth, in my life, in our church, in the world. Is God's name considered and treated as a holy thing in this world right now? No, right? The world at large hates him. That's our natural state. That's a carnal mind. is an enmity with God. They cannot receive the things of God. The gospel is just foolishness. But what's the glory about that kingdom coming? 
We've got the glimpse of the kingdom. We've got the, the kind of the, the ambassadorship, the embassies here of God's kingdom. That's what the churches are, right? Emb- uh, embassies, right? Representatives of a kingdom that's far away. But that kingdom's going to come in a physical presence. And you know what his name will be then? Holy, hallowed. <laughs> hallowed be thy name. So this is, a, this is a request. May I count your name as holy. Something set apart for a high and glorious purpose. One that I take it as that you're my father and I want to follow you and that your name is not cheap. I, don't, I certainly don't use it as a mere slur word. I ham, you know, slam my thumb with a hammer. Right? May your name be hallowed. Thy kingdom come. This is a request. Of all the things that we ask for, what better answer to prayer can there be than thy kingdom come? Because where would all your other requests go? Out the window. You don't need them anymore. <laughs> Father, come quickly. Lord, come quickly. Thy kingdom come. You know, there, there's statements here, but, but put a may in there. Maybe that will help you understand it. May your kingdom come. I'm, it's a request. May your kingdom come. What am I longing for? What am I desiring? What am I burning for? I'm desiring righteousness. When will righteousness fully come? When His kingdom comes. And not just as an embassy. An embassy is just that one little piece of sovereign ground within a big old foreign nation. It's, you know, it's, it's owned by the host nation, but you can't see the rest of that nation. Well, one day that nation is coming. And everything that's corrupt and vile and broken in this world will be made right and righteous and whole. These are short words, but these are big points. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Now, can by me praying, can it make God's will done or not done? No. But can it change whether I'm submissive and desiring that His will be done? Because not only whose will are we really praying for? Lord, may my will be done in a timely manner, right? Instead of submitting, Lord, may thine will be done. It's an acknowledgement that He is sovereign. Sovereign means the boss, the top, right? There's no one that He reports to. We report to Him, right? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Is there any angel He's ever said go? And the angel said no. (coughs) Thine earth, and I know that there's the, the fallen angels. The point is, is that we are to be desiring that the wise God, the all-knowing God, the one whose ways and thoughts and plans are higher than ours, that His will will be done, that we'll be submissive to it, and that we'll be patient for it, rather than putting our desires and our wills and our pride in the forefront as it is in heaven. Right? Here you've got your first really request for just us. Give us this day our daily bread. How large of a supply is daily bread? Just enough. Just enough for that day. Now, I don't know if you're anything like me, but when I go to Wally World, get groceries, I tend to buy a little bit more than one day supply. By asking for our daily bread, this is an acknowledgement of the truth, is that we are dependent upon God for every scrap of food that makes it into our mouth. Okay? You could go to Walmart and buy out the grocery section. And the Lord could have a fire at your house and burn it all down, and tomorrow you'd have nothing. We are dependent upon Him for our daily bread. We're dependent upon us for our very breath. If He were to take it away, that would be the end of us. So this is an acknowledgement of our dependence. We love being independent. We love feeling like we're in charge. We love that feeling. But is that best? 
And is that real? Or is it just an illusion? Give us this day our daily bread. I am dependent. I am coming as a poor beggar. I've got no merits to plead. I'm coming to a righteous Father who loves me and who is merciful, and He continues to sustain me day after day after day. In addition to natural bread, how about spiritual bread? Right? We need Him to feed us. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. We have access to the Bible, and we can spend some time reading in it. But if the Holy Ghost isn't helping us, and He isn't feeding us, we're just kind of marking time. Desiring and hungering, thirsting for His Word, like that newborn babe desires milk. Right? We're dependent upon Him. Twelve. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Another um, gospel would say trespasses. Forgive us our trespasses, our debts, our sins. Lord, forgive us, us, our debts, as, same sentence, we forgive our debtors, those who have trespassed against us, those who have sinned against us, those who have debts that they owe us. It's a wrong that's been done, and they owe me, and there needs to be some vengeance, right? God's forgiven us. We're called to forgive them. And as we're praying, Lord, forgive us for our sins again as we're forgiving others. Now, it'll say that for if you forgive men their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Heavenly Father, your Father forgive your trespasses. Why? You ever had a kid come to you and apologize for something, but they are still angry and bent out of shape, and it's a sorry, half-hearted apology. Maybe you were that kid, right? It wasn't that long ago. Right? You haven't learned the lesson yet. There's not real repentance. And so when we go to our Heavenly Father and say, Lord, forgive us for our sins, and yet we're still in a state of rebellion, holding anger and hatred and vehemence over someone else's wrong, guess, guess what? We're still being rebellious. And so we've got to actually let go of that sin. And then go ask for repentance. Ask for forgiveness with a repentant heart. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Temptation, that can be testing, trials. Now sometimes He will lead us into trials and for our own good. But ultimately, asking for Him to deliver us from evil. And you know what? He's promised that He will. Right? Nothing is going to overtake his children and his church to separate them from the love of God. Period. Full stop. There's a lot of sorry teachers out there who will scare God's little children about what they or someone else can do to separate them from the love of God. Christ's work is vic- Christ's work is finished. It is victorious. There is nothing to pull one of God's children out of his hand. <coughs> Period. But that doesn't mean sometimes we don't feel scared. And so when we're going to our Father, praying again, deliver us from the evil. Is there evil in this world? Yes. Do we have a spiritual warfare that we're called to? Put on the armor of God, battle in the quarter of His power and His might to stand fast against the wiles of the devil, against principalities and powers and high places and spiritual wickedness that exist. Yes, it exists. There is evil in the world. And we've got armor. You can go read over there in Ephesians 6 to see about that, equipping yourself and His power and, and the, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit and all those things. But who's ultimately your refuge? God! Right? And this is just another acknowledgement of that, of that I am dependent upon you. All right. So again, we have this pattern. Not doing things to be seen to men. Not whether you're giving alms, 
compassion, showing mercy, not where you're praying, not doing it in a manner so that you're out in the public and everyone want, want everybody to see, but praying in a manner to, to your Heavenly Father. And not using vain repetitions of just going over and over and over and over again the same thing. Right? But praying to your Heavenly Father because you're actually communing with Him. This is not a box that has to be checked. You get to communicate and interact and have fellowship with your Heavenly Father. This is a good thing. This is not something to suffer through. Does sometimes your prayer life feel cold? Mine does. There's an illustration that Brother Zach Guest used. There's a park near where he lives, and he likes to go walk there. Sometimes in the cold winter, he'll walk, and he'll have to be wearing a real heavy coat. And when he starts off, he's real cold. He sees his breath. You know, it's 30 degrees outside. He's cold, and he's walking. But after about 10 minutes of walking, you know what happens? He starts to warm up. He takes off his coat. He keeps walking another 10 or 15. He's hot. He starts taking off the sweater and got the coat wrapped around him. And after about an hour or so, he's comfortable. He's walking, right? The idea is sometimes when we're praying, we stop in that first 10 minutes, that first few minutes where, yeah, you're cold, but keep going. There are sweet times of fellowship when you're communing with your Lord. And just because you don't feel like it at the moment doesn't mean you need to draw back. It's not about the feeling. Right? Sometimes the Lord blesses it with, with a sweet, sweet experience. Sometimes He doesn't. But continue to do it. Lean into it. Go further. Commune further. Drop off of the superficial prayers that, if you're anything like me, you get into the habit where you've got kind of your canned phrases and expressions, and this is what I'm supposed to pray, and this is what I'm supposed to pray, and like, okay, box checked. Now I can go to sleep or, or whatever. But think of it as an opportunity to have a conversation, a relationship, an experience where you're drawing close to your Father and knowing that He loves you and knowing that He desires the best for you, even if you don't know what that is. And what can be better than being close to Him and glorifying Him and pleasing Him? Alright. Last category here is, starts in verse 16, is fasting. Fasting. When you're abstaining from food, um, you're afflicting your soul, um, trying to give yourself focus on a particular issue. You know, prayer and fasting, you know, back in Nineveh. Right? Jonah went to Nineveh. Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh, right? He might have taken a boat the opposite direction. He got chunked over, had a whale take him back the other way, right? Then he had to walk a long way to get inland to Nineveh. Right? He didn't want to go because he didn't want to see God be merciful to these people. Well, he goes and gives a message to this Nineveh, the capital of Syria, that God's going to destroy you all unless you repent. And you know what they did? They repented. You know what that looked like? Sitting in sackcloth and ashes, they took off their pretty clothes. They put on some humble clothes. They put ashes on their head, acknowledging their grossness, their vileness. And they're fasting and they're praying and they're beseeching God fervently that perhaps He would spare them, right? And so the idea of fasting is accompanying a fervent, fervent desire in seeking God, right? Are you doing it for other men's benefit? Are you doing it to be seen of other men? That's what's going on here is that there was... A custom at that time of when people, the hypocrites, the ones who were playing the part, it was time to fast. I fast, you know, twice a week or three times a week or however often they did it. They would disfigure their face, right? I'll look a little funny if you don't go through your morning routine, right? Don't do your hair, don't wash your face. Maybe smear a little ashes or something over there so you look a little sunk in and a little blackness over your eyes, right? Whatever they were doing, they were doing it so that people could look at them and say, ooh, He's fasting today. I saw him two days ago and he looked like that. He was fasting two days ago. This guy fasts all the time. Wow, how religious he must be. Jesus says, but when you fast, again, when you fast, not if, when you are fervently seeking the Lord on a matter, when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, that you appear not to fast. He says, don't go through the motions to distort yourself so that you look like you're fasting. Go through your normal routine so nobody knows. Right? Again, sometimes you can get in trouble. 
Well, I, I can't tell you why I can't have lunch with you today, right? It's, it's a secret. It's not, no, you're not, you're not called to lie about fasting or anything. It's just don't do it for the motivation of being seen. So don't set yourself up so that I want people to see what I'm doing and so I'm changing my behavior so they'll see. He's saying, no, to go through your normal routine. Look like your normal self. That way the only person who you're really motivated to serve and to please is your Heavenly Father. Okay? To appear not to men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. I'm going to go to one last verse, and that's in 1 Timothy chapter 5. There's a couplet here. 1 Timothy 5, 24 and 25. It says, Some men's sins are open beforehand. Going before to judgment. Sometimes you publicly know what other people's sins have been. Right? And some men, they follow after. That means this, that some, they've, they've done a better job of hiding it. But at the judgment, it'll be revealed and made plain. Made plain. It, there's no hiding. Right? What's the flip side? Likewise, also, are the good works of some manifest beforehand particularly if there's trumpets blown beforehand or there's memorial plaques. Like, oh, this has been donated by, right? All the things where you're seeking the accolades of men. Some men's good works are known beforehand. And they that are otherwise cannot be hid. Your Heavenly Father knows when you're doing works for His benefit. He knows when you're seeking Him in faith and, faith and you're pleasing Him. And at the shining, they'll be acknowledged. 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. We're going to have different fruit born over our walks of our life. But y'all, there should be some urgency to be about our Father's business. The seeking first the kingdom of heaven, which is what we'll get to next time, and His righteousness should come first. We should care about how we serve God. The truth of our doctrine that Jesus' work did it all should not be an excuse for us to be lazy or lackadaisical. I'm not saying your works will get you to heaven. They won't. You can't be good enough. His work is the only one that secured that. But because of what He's done, there should be a change. And when we're born again, there should be a market change. Are you going to grow all at one time? Right? Is that how crops come up? Ooh, I threw out a seed, seed died, a little sprout. I'm going to go harvest. No, you got to, you got to mature. You got to continue to grow. And so there's a growth process. You may be growing faster than I am, and you've got more fruit than I am, but that's okay. I'm not here to be seen of you or to seen of you or to judge you because you're not like me, right? But we're all to grow together, encourage together. Continue to draw closer to the Lord day by day. Why? To please Him, to seek Him, to glorify Him. What purpose are you here for? Well, so I can get married and have kids and make money and retire comfortably and all those things that the American dream. Woo! No. <laughs> we get distorted with that. You're here to glorify God in whatever role He puts you in. If you're married, your job is to glorify God in your marriage. Loving your spouse with everything you got. If you got kids, it's glorifying God and how you're raising the kids. Operating like a heavenly father does for you. That's how you operate down. Use that example. Set the mirror. Right? Whatever your position in life is now, your role is the same. Glorify God. Find how it is that you can serve Him and serve Him. Even if you're a kid. Kids, 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 eye contact kids. Right? Your job is the same as your parents' job. Your job is to glorify God. You know there's some specific instructions given to kids on ways they can glorify God? You want to know what those are? Honor thy father and mother. Obey thy father and mother. Right? When you do that, guess who you're glorifying? God. Not doing it just so mom and daddy get off your back. Right? That's kind of being the scene of men. That's kind of the superficial level. But honoring your parents, glorifying, glorifies God. Obeying your parents, glorifying God. Right? Loving your parents, glorifies God. One day, your parents are going to get old. 
You know whose job it's going to be to take care of them? Y'all's! <laughs> that comes with honoring your parents. There's no one too young. And there's no one too old. <laughs> we all have the same purpose. And we need to be about that business. With some urgency. And if you got questions, come talk to me. And we'll look at scripture and we'll learn and we'll grow together. Because ignorance is no excuse. Right? Do you all have a copy of the Bible? Is it written in your language? Do you have the ability to do a real fast word search or concordance search or text search? You all do. The information's there. We need to not be lazy. We need to go hunt it up if we're really confused. And if we know what to do, guess what? We gotta go do it. Amen? That's what it says at the end of that, that verse, right? Amen. You know what that means? So let it be. Let this come to pass. Let it happen. Why do we say amen at the end of our prayers? Because these should be our ardent desires and wishes. That God's kingdom will come, that His will will be done, that His name will be hallowed, that He'll continue to preserve us and provide for us for one more day. Because why? He may come tomorrow. Our prayers could be answered if He comes tomorrow. I don't need three days supply. Just give me today. So let it be. So let it be. Amen.